Welcome to Esther's Legacy, where we are here for such a time as this. Last week we looked at 1 Corinthians and how we saw Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits in the book of 1 Corinthians and how Paul used that as the backdrop of that book. Well, today we're going to get back to the book of Esther. So, welcome back to the book of Esther. Get your Bibles out. Um, get your pen and paper ready. We're going to do a little bit of Bible study on Esther chapter 6 today. Okay, Xerxes couldn't sleep, right? Haman has decided to build the gallows for Mordecai at the advice of his wife and his friends. And he's excited at the possibility of destroying his enemy. But in the meantime... Uh, Xerxes couldn't sleep. So let's pick up in chapter 6, verse 1. I, again, I'm reading out of the complete Jewish Bible. It says, That night the king couldn't sleep. So he ordered the records of the daily journal brought, and they were read to the king. It was found written that Mordecai had told about Bethantha and Teresh, two of the king's officers from the group in charge of the private entryways who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. The king answered, What honor or distinction was conferred on Mordecai for this? The king's servants answered, Nothing was done for him. All right. We're going to stop there for a minute. So Xerxes cannot sleep. If you remember, he had just met with Esther and Haman at the banquet that Esther had prepared. And Esther has told him, basically, I have something very serious to tell you. Hit that button real quick there. I have something very serious to tell you. If... <clears throat> If you are not prepared, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. If you are not prepared to answer my question now, I need you to really consider answering my question in the positive, my husband, and, and granting me my request because what I'm going to ask for is very large. And so Xerxes goes away more than likely really wondering what is it his wife is going to ask for? And so he can't sleep. Now you would think, you know, notice it even talks about a banquet of wine in uh, chapter 5. And yet even with the wine in him, he still cannot sleep. Whether he's sitting there wondering about what she's going to ask for, or God is just divinely keeping him awake. He decides to call for the records to be read. And the record that God allows to be brought in to be read to him is the one that contains the report about Mordecai saving his life. And notice that it is Xerxes that asks what honor or distinction was conferred on Mordecai. Xerxes wants to honor Mordecai. Got that? Xerxes wants to pay him honor. And he's wanting some advice about that. He first wants to know, was he honored for it? Because apparently that is not recorded within the record. And so that is where we pick up in verse, let's see here, in verse 4, the king then asked, Who, who's that in the courtyard? For Haman had come into the outer courtyard of the king's palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had prepared for him. And the king's servants told him, It's Haman standing there in the courtyard. The king said, have him come in. 
He sees Haman in the courtyard, but can't tell who it is. Who is that in the courtyard? His servants tell him it's Haman. Haman, again, is all excited about getting to ask permission to kill Mordecai. He's just giddy about the idea of killing his enemy. And so he comes in to the king, thinking that's what his audience with the king is going to be about. But we know when we go before the king, it's not us. Remember our lesson from Shabbat restoration? Ladies, do you remember? It's not us that sets the agenda. It's the king that sets the agenda. Haman thinks he's going to go in with his agenda to discuss with the king. But the king has a different agenda that he wants to discuss with Haman. And so in verse 6, we see, So Haman came in, and the king said to him, This the king speaks first, and he does not ask, Haman, what would you like today? What is it you're here for? What, what did you come to see me about? That's not what he asks. The king said to him, What should be done for a man that the king wants to honor? Hmm. Xerxes wants to honor Mordecai, but he doesn't tell Haman who he wants to honor. Now, the king more than likely knows, at least by this time, that Mordecai, at least, is a Jew. He knows the decree he's made about the Jews. But regardless of any of that, he also knows that Mordecai in the past has saved his life and was never honored for it. And so knowing that it was with Haman that he decided to destroy the Jews, he does not tell Haman at this point who it is he wants to honor because he wants an honest um, opinion about how to honor someone. He doesn't want that opinion to be tarnished with, oh, you want to honor him? We don't want to honor him. So let me say something that's small, teeny tiny, just barely honored, just in order to answer the king's question. No, he wants a real honest answer to his question. And Haman thought to himself, whom would the king want to honor more than me? After all, I'm his right-hand man. After all, I'm the one <clears throat> who sat down with him and got him to agree to destroy the Jewish people. I'm the one who's in charge of this scenario. And I've come in here to ask permission to destroy and to kill my personal enemy. Who is it that the king wants to honor more than me? He's even put me above all his other officials, which means he's also put me above all the rest of his family. And so Haman answered the king, for a man the king wants to honor, have royal, let's see here, have royal robes brought which the king himself wears and the horse the king himself rides with a royal crown on its head. The robes and the horse should be handed over to one of the king's most respected officials and they should put the robes on the man the king wants to honor and lead him on horseback through the streets of the city, proclaiming ahead of him, this is what is done for the man whom the king wants to honor. And the king said to Haman, hurry and take the robes and the horse as you said. We're going to stop just right there for a minute. Because Haman is just, he's thinking of the biggest wow he can think of. 
what would be better? What would I want to do more than be robed in the king's robe and placed on the king's horse and paraded about the town with a herald in front of me proclaiming I am the one the king wants to honor? We're going we're gonna to keep going. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth in just a minute. So the king said to Haman, hurry and take the robes and the horse, as you said, and do this for Mordecai the Jew. See, Xerxes knows Mordecai is a Jew. Do this for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate and don't leave out anything you mentioned don't leave anything out and so Haman took the robes and the horse dressed Mordecai Haman personally had to dress Mordecai and led him riding through the streets of the city as he proclaimed ahead of him this is what is done for a man whom the king wants to honor. Then Mordecai returned to the king's gate. But Haman rushed home with his head covered in mourning. Alright, let's take an in-depth look at this because we see a couple of things here. We see God's people being paraded. We see through Mordecai, we see uh, the enemy being cursed and knowing it. So I want to take a more in-depth look at that. Okay? Now I'm going to say from the onset that this is not a perfect parallel of one of the things I want to talk about. Okay? But notice that the that Mordecai is robed in the king's robe. He puts on the king so that when others see him, who do they see? They see the king's robe, the king's clothes, i.e., on the king's horse, i.e., they're supposed to see a reflection of the king. It may be Mordecai's face, but he is a reflection of the king. Okay? Let me get rid of something here. What does that remind you of? Okay? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 20, Paul has just talked about don't be like the pagans, right? But, but this is not the lesson you learned from Messiah, okay? To act and be like the pagans. It's not what you learned from Messiah. Verse 21, if you really listened to him and were instructed about him, then you learn that since what is in Yeshua is truth, he is the truth, correct? Then so far as your former way of life is concerned, you must strip off your old nature because your old nature is thoroughly rotted by its deceptive practices. And you must let your spirits and minds keep being renewed and clothe yourself with the new nature created to be godly, which expresses itself in righteousness and holiness that flow from the truth. And who is truth? Yeshua is truth. We're putting on Yeshua to be a reflection of of Yeshua. 
Now let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Okay. Uh, verse 5 starts out saying, Therefore put to death the earthly parts of your nature. And it talks about what those are. Verse um, 9, Because you have stripped away the old self with its ways and have put on the new self, which is continually being renewed in fuller and fuller knowledge, knowledge, closer and closer to the image of its creator. The new self allows no room for discriminating between Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised, foreigner, savage, slave, free man, on the contrary, in all, the Messiah is everything. Okay? So we are to clothe ourselves, right, with our Creator, with Yeshua. We are to be a reflection of Him. Just as the book of Hebrews says that Yeshua is a perfect reflection of the radiance of the Father. Okay? Remember, the Spirit is the one who transforms us into the image of the Son. We clothe ourselves. We put on Yeshua. Okay? That is what is happening to Mordecai. He is being clothed. He is putting on. He is becoming a reflection of the King. Am I got that? And then he is led or paraded through the streets. Now, in Mordecai's case, he is being uh, paraded through the streets by his enemy. And we'll talk about the importance of that in just a minute. But one thing that we see in 2 Corinthians, go to 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, again, we did last week, the backdrop of 1 Corinthians was, again, Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. Well, the backdrop of 2 Corinthians is actually the Jewish wedding and the fall feasts. Okay? And in chapter 2, Beginning in 14, we see something that we see here in the book of Esther. Okay? Only it's God doing the parading and not the enemy. Okay? Let's let's look. But they forgetting in verse 14 of chapter 2. But thanks be to God who in Messiah constantly leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of what it means to know him. We're clothed with him. We're on his horse, so to speak. He is parading us through a triumphal procession. And we are reflecting his glory, who he is. We are clothed in him. And so we are the fragrance of what it means to know him. For to God, we are the aroma of the Messiah. When he sees us, he sees the Messiah. But among those... I'm sorry, both among those being saved and among those being lost. To the latter, to those being saved, we are, I'm sorry, to the latter, those being lost, we are the smell of death leading only to more death. That is what Haman is smelling at the moment uh, with Mordecai. That is the fragrance Haman is smelling. But to the former, those being saved, we are the sweet smell of life leading 
to more life. What's going on in the book of Esther? What we're seeing happening to Mordecai in this moment is in essence a first fruit, a small portion of what will happen later in the book. It's a foretaste of what happens later in the book. Who is equal to such a task? For we are not like a lot of folks who go about, the word they've got here is huckstering God's message for a fee. On the contrary, we speak out of a sincere heart as people sent by God, standing in God's presence, living in union with Messiah. God takes his people. He clothes us with Messiah. And he leads us in triumphal procession. And to him and to those being saved, we are the fragrance of Messiah. To those being lost, to those who don't know Messiah, we are the fragrance of death, their death. Because that triumphal procession means their destruction. You understand that? That is what is happening in the book of Esther in chapter 6. That is what Haman himself is realizing. Even though he's the one doing the parading, again, like I said, this is what I was talking about when I said, not a perfect parallel, okay? But even though he's the one doing the parading, he understands that what is happening with Mordecai is going to mean his destruction. But he does it. He does it. In essence, God has already begun to make Haman the footstool. Okay? Remember, God tells the Messiah in Psalm 110 that he's going to make his enemies his footstool. That is what's begun to happen to Haman. Haman is falling into a trap. He thought he was going to set a trap for his enemy, and he has fallen into God's trap. Okay? God has caused a reversal to take place using Xerxes' lack of sleep, bringing out a particular scroll, putting it in the heart of Xerxes to want to honor Haman, I'm sorry, I want to honor Mordecai despite everything else. Haman is becoming the footstool and he's falling into his own trap. Let's look at Psalms 57, 6. Psalms, let me get there. Psalms 57, 6 says, Um, if you're using a Bible that has Jewish numbering, it's verse 7. Uh, but I'm going to start the ver in the verse before, okay? Be exalted, God, above heaven. May the glory, may your glory be over all the earth. They prepared a snare for my feet, but I am bending over in order to avoid it. They dug a pit ahead of me but they fell into it themselves. Then in Proverbs 28, verse 10, Proverbs 28, 
verse 10. Let me get there. We read this. Whoever causes the honest causes the honest to pursue evil ways will himself fall into his own pit but the pure hearted will inherit good here we see the idea again of someone falling into their own trap their own pit that is what we see here happening with Haman Haman ha is falling in to this pit that he's not going to be able to get out of in essence, what's happening with Haman is Haman has begun to experience the curse. Mordecai has begun to experience the blessing. His enemy is becoming his footstool. But Haman is beginning to experience the curse. We find the list of the blessings and the curses in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I want to read a couple of the curses to you so that you can see this is specifically what's beginning to happen to Haman. Okay, verse 25 says, Adonai, will, your God, will cause you to be defeated by your enemies. You will advance on them one way and flee from them seven. You will become an object of horror to every kingdom on earth. Your carcasses will become food for all the birds in the air and the wild animals, and there will be no one to scare them away. Remember, that's what Haman wanted to do to Mordecai. He built the gallows. And the gallows isn't what a, a gallows like we think of it, hang to your dead by the neck. A gallows back in the day of... Mordecai and Esther meant you were killed and then your dead corpse was put up on, on this stake as a trophy for the birds to come and eat. As an example of horror. Okay? That's what he wanted to happen to Mordecai. But God says what? Haman? That's what's going to happen to you. Okay. Um, if you look over in, let's see here, verse 43. And again, Deuteronomy 28 is speaking to the Israelites uh, about their disobedience to God and what would happen to them if they obey God, they get, they, there's the blessing. If they disobey God, they, there's the curse. But the principle of blessing and cursing, when others come against God's people, like Haman is doing in the book of Esther, the curses apply to them as well. Okay? So... Here we see in verse 43, the foreigner living with you will rise higher and higher while you sink lower and lower. Mordecai, in this essence, is the foreigner in Persia. And here he is becoming higher and higher. And Haman, right, who's an official of Persia, is going lower and lower. Basically, he's the prime minister of Persia, basically, is who he is. And he's going lower and lower. He will be let he will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. He will be the head and you will be the tail. Haman becomes the footstool and the tail. Okay? That is what Haman is experiencing here in chapter 6. He is getting the foretaste of what is coming in his future. And so when he realizes that, once the deed is done, and he's done what the king commanded him to do, he goes home, right, with his head covered in mourning because he knows what's coming 
Mordecai, however, returns the king's gate. Remember, as long as he was in sackcloth and ashes, he could go up to the king's gate, but he couldn't go through the king's gate. Okay? Within the king's gate. Okay? But now he goes back to the king's gate. He goes back to his job. He goes back to do what it is expected of him to do. Verse 13 of Esther 6 says, After Haman had told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him, these are the people that advised him to build the gallows, right? To display Mordecai's dead body on. His advisors, okay, and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai before whom you have begun to fall is a Jew. And believe me, the world knew the reputation of the God of the Jews. And what just happened in that city? The whole city saw this Jew who's supposed to be condemned to die. Not just because Haman wanted to kill him immediately and then place his body on the gallows, but he's condemned to die because he's a Jew and they've already made the decree to destroy all the Jews. So, if Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is a Jew, you will not get the better of him. On the contrary, your downfall before him is certain. Haman already knew that. And here his wife and his friends are confirming that. He's being elevated. You have been lowered. And we know the reputation of the God of the Jews. He is working on behalf of Mordecai. They knew that. They instinctively knew that. We also have to understand that within the Eastern culture, there is this idea of honor and shame. If someone is honored, that means someone's being shamed. Okay? Someone's being elevated, somebody's being lowered. Remember, we just read that in, in Deuteronomy. The head and the tail, higher and lower, right? That is what they're seeing. And that is their understanding of that. That Mordecai has begin, begun to be elevated and lifted higher. He's becoming the head. Haman, you are being diminished. You have been lowered. You're becoming the tail. Destruction is coming your way, according to the God of the Jews. And according to just the basic concepts of understanding within the Eastern culture. Whether it's Jew, Persian, Babylonian, uh, you see the uh, distortion of this still even today within um, Islam and Muslim culture. So there's this idea of honor and shame being played out right here. And while they were still talking with him, the king's officials came, hurrying to bring Haman to the banquet Esther had prepared. And Haman would never see his wife and friends and sons again. We know that. We know the story. But we'll get into that fully next time. But we need to understand that God works on behalf of his people. And God, God wants to parade in triumphal procession his people before the world. Because his people reflect his son. 
are clothed in their creator. And when that happens, it means life for God's people. It means destruction for God's enemies. Okay. Blessing and cursing. Remember there will come a day when he will separate the sheep from the goats. Right? It speaks of that day. And again, that's part of the understanding of the fall feast. Correct? So I hope um, that you've learned something about the book of Esther today. I hope it has been edifying to you. I hope you are excited about the fact that our Father, our Creator, our God wants to parade His people in triumphal procession as we reflect Messiah. Clothe yourself with Messiah. Allow his fragrance to permeate everything around you. Display the blessings of the kingdom. God bless you. I've enjoyed this time with you. Shalom.